Okay. Yeah, I'm here. It's good to be here today. Good to be here with you guys on Palm Sunday. The, uh, this is the Sunday every year that we remember and celebrate the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Um, and he was, um, he was coming uh, to a mixed crowd of people who, some who worshipped him, some who wanted him to fail and be put into his proper place as they saw it. Uh, but it says um, in Luke chapter 19, verse 37, it says, As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And um, so, you know, Jesus' disciples on that day were standing in his presence, giving glory to God and praising him for the mighty works that they had seen. And Jesus is saying, that is the way that it will be. Not the way that it should be. That is the way that it will be. Will you be there singing in that chorus? Or am I going to have to replace you with physical things that will follow their proper order? And uh, I'm going to say this morning, I choose to stand and give praise to God and glorify him the way that is right today on this Palm Sunday. So if you guys would stand with me, we're going to worship this morning. Father God, we are so grateful to be able to be in your presence this morning and every day. God, we're grateful to be a part of your family and to be able to stand here and give glory to you with the voices that you have given us. God, we declare this morning that you are good and it is right and just for you to be praised. And so we stand here in your presence and we say, holy is the Lord. Blessed be the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. God, come and have your way in this service. Not our will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Everlasting, it's an everlasting love. Your mercy is as new as every rising of the sun. And your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. Your grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Your power and your glory are forever on display. And your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. Oh, it's better, oh, better than life. Oh, so much better, Jesus, your loving kindness is better than life. Bears of ten thousand, of ten thousand you are fair. Nothing in this world could ever measure or compare to your loving kindness. Loving kindness is better than life. All your ways are just, oh Lord, you're just in all your ways. And I will lift my hands, oh Lord, with gratitude and praise. For your loving kindness, loving kindness is better than life. Oh, it's better, oh, better than life. Oh, so much better, Jesus, your loving kindness. Better than life. Jesus, your loving kindness is better than life itself. Better than life itself. 
better than life Better than life Ooh, It's better better. We thank you, Lord God. We bless your name. We praise you. There's just some problems only God can fix. All of my trials want me down to this. I've seen it happen time and time again. There's just some problems only God can fix. There's just some battles flesh and blood can't win. There'll be some moments that just don't make sense. Can't see you now. But I'm still convinced There's just some problems Only God can fix Not by power Not by might By the spirit of the living Spirit of the living God Not my battle not by fire, by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. I've seen a breakthrough that I can't explain. I found a healing hidden in my pain. I know a dead man that once brought the grave. I've seen a breakthrough, and I will learn again. Not by power, not by might, by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. Not my battle, not my fight, by the Spirit of the living Spirit of the living God, by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. My fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower, my helper. Defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, 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 someone let the people know anything is possible. No weapon will prosper, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My helper. Defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, 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 oh. someone let the devil know, tell him that he's gotta go. No weapon will prosper, still a strong tower, still a strong tower.
Amen. It's good to come into the house of the Lord and to just worship him for who he is. Y'all can be seated. I have a few announcements. Um, so everything we do is by God's spirit, but he chooses to use us to help. And we have Easter Sunday coming up. And it is an awesome opportunity to worship God, thank him for what he's doing um, and who he is, um, and also to serve people. So uh, next Sunday at 10 a.m., we're going to have brunch um, for Easter, and the theme is it's all true. Everything that the Bible says is completely true, and it's a great opportunity to invite people to come. The brunch will start at 10 a.m., and the actual service will start at 10.30. So tell people to come at 10 so they can eat and everything, and then at 10.30 we'll have our worship time, and then afterwards we'll have stuff for the kids. So it's going to be really, really great. Um, so please make sure you're praying and inviting people to come for Easter. Uh, we also have a few things to do to prepare for Easter Sunday. So we have a sign-up sheet for brunch out in the foyer. Um, if you walk out either of these doors back here and walk straight back to that like bar area, there is a sign-up sheet that you can sign up to bring food for next week. Um, we also would love if you are able um, to stay after service today and help us set up the sanctuary with tables and stuff for Easter, that would be fantastic, and we would really appreciate it. And then if you are part of the worship team and you plan to sing on Easter Sunday, please come to practice on Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. and Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. so that y'all can practice and um, be ready and prepared for Easter Sunday. So um, I just, let's say a quick prayer just for Easter and for God to continue to move on Easter Sunday. Lord, we just thank you um, for sending Jesus. We proclaim that he is the Messiah, that he did die for our sins and rise again to life. We just ask that this, Sunday, uh, this Easter Sunday that you would just come and be here that people would experience you for the first time, that your presence would just go forth from this place, that you would empower us this week to invite people and stir in people's hearts who have never come to church before to come to Bethel on Easter Sunday. In your name we pray, amen. All right, and then I have uh, two more announcements, um, and then we'll get back into worship. So Janet... Um, is Janet Hawkins is home from the hospital, I believe, um, and she um, she will need some help with different things. So if you uh, think that you would be able to help out in any way, please see Shauna after the service or send her a text and ask her what you could do to help um, with Janet after that surgery and everything. Um, and then we also have um, connect cards in the seat back in front of you. If you have a change in address, um, or if this is your first time here, or you just need, have a prayer request you would like us to pray for on Wednesday nights, please fill that out and leave it on Guest Central um, right out in the foyer, and we will be sure to update your information or add that to the prayer. Um, and then we also have um, giving available. You can give out in the foyers or you can give online. You can text to give. You can use your phone to give. Uh, there's lots of ways to worship the Lord through giving. Um, and it's just a joy and a delight to be able to do that. So if you have the opportunity, that information is on the screen. And now we will get back into worship. Y'all can stand, on, stand up again. <laughs>
surrendering completely, laying all my cares at your feet. I put my trust in you. When I don't know what to do, I will fix my eyes on you. You're my defender. I hide my hope in you. You are the loving arms my broken heart can run to. And I will remember that there is nothing you can't do. Cause you are God, you are good, and I surrender. A mighty fortress is our God. I will not fear, I will not fear. Safe and secure here in your will. I will not fear. And when I don't know what to do, Jesus, I will fix my eyes on you. You're my defender. I hide my hope in you. You are the loving arms my broken heart can run to. I will remember that there is nothing you can do. Cause you are God, you are good, and I surrender. You're my defender. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for speaking in such special ways to us, Lord God. And may we daily be compelled to surrender laying down everything, Lord God. You want our all. Not looking back, Lord God. Not demanding what we want, Lord God, but what you want. You are with us in every battle. Help us to fully understand that, Lord God. Trust that. That even when things around us don't look right, that you're there that you're in the fire, Lord God, with us.
Lord, help our unbelief. Keep building our faith, Lord God. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. are closing in when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone there was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free Then lost the bears, the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire For dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. that holds nobody and power lives in me there was another in the fire oh, there was another in the fire oh, there was another in the fire oh, The darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's then. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. Should I ever need reminding? How good you've been to me? I'll count the joy, come every battle. 
Cause I know that's where you'll be Be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water Holding back the seeds And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy in every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be be. I'll count the joy in every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Mm, count it all joy, God. I'll count it all joy. Oh, we count it all joy. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We say Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest this morning. Lord, we are aware that you are the king that came to save. We choose to cry out this morning. You are so worthy, Lord God. I know I'm grateful that we have a preview, that we know the grave is empty, that we understand that it's true, Lord God. We've had a glimpse of the power, Lord God. And Lord, we know that you are calling us to be fully surrendered so that we can fully know your power. We can better understand who you are and who we are in you. Lord, we thank you. We accept the forgiveness, Lord God. We accept your power. We accept all the gifts that you want to give us, Lord God. But most of all, Lord, we are just so grateful that we get to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we just pray that you will be with the needs of our body, Lord God, of our family, Lord, that you will heal, Lord God. You will physically heal, Lord, touching Janet, continuing to do the good work that you're already doing, Lord God. that you will be with all of our minds, Lord God, and our hearts, becoming more and more like you, Lord God, wearing you instead of ourselves. Lord, give us boldness. Give us joy. Give us peace, patience, Lord God. All your gifts. Lord, help us to do the hard things, whatever that is that you're calling us to, whatever you're putting before us, Lord God. We understand that if we are living, Lord, we still have work to do. And make that work very clear to us, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you will be with every financial need that's represented here, Lord God. And ultimately, Lord God, we pray for those that we know that are not saved. May you draw all men unto yourself, Lord God. Lord, if you give us a word to speak, let us speak it. Lord, if you put a task before us, like serving somebody who doesn't know you, to show your love, let us do it, Lord God. May we be your hands and feet. Whether it's this week, building up to Easter, Lord God, or beyond Easter, we just pray that you allow us to be obedient to those things that you've called us to. Lord, and in our world, there are so many things going on. I just pray for your peace, 
that your hand will be over in, in Haiti, Lord God, in Russia and Ukraine, Lord God, and other places where there's distress and turmoil, Lord God. I pray your hand. Lord, allow your believers, our believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ to raise up, Lord God. I pray that you will encourage them, Lord God, that you will equip them. We thank you that you know exactly what is needed. Thank you for being God. Continue to bless the remainder of our service, Lord God. Be with Pastor as he speaks. What the Holy Spirit has given him to say. Lord, touch our hearts and our minds. Lord God, allow us to be open to the things of you. So that whenever we leave this building, Lord, we're not the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see you this morning. Good to be able to be here worshiping the Lord together. And we're going to get into the Word in just a minute. We will let the boys and girls, 12 years old and younger, be dismissed to Children's Church. If you'll meet Miss Tori up here and out this door here. All right. Praise God. All right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. So we are in the last week of an exciting six-week series Made for mission. Now, if you've been MIA lately, maybe you've missed a, a service or two, let me just give you a real quick uh, review to catch you up, all right? So we started out by saying we are all called. Calling is not for the spiritually elite, but for everyone who calls Jesus Lord. Week two, we answered the question, what's my mission? We said our mission is Jesus' mission, so we better find out what he's about. <laughs> then week three, we asked, what's my message? Uh, if I'm made for a mission, then what do I say when I'm on it, right? We learned our message is simple. We just share how God's goodness has intersected with our lives. Week four, two weeks ago, we looked at who's my mission. We said it's simply those around us that God has strategically placed around us wherever we live, our work, or play, all right? Today, we are combining week five and six, all right, so you get two in one today. Aren't you excited? Amen. All right. Now, now you're thinking, does that mean it's double the length? No. All right, it won't, it won't be double the length. All right. So, but we're going to answer the question first this morning, why am I on mission? Let's make sure we have the why settled in our lives. And then we're con going to conclude with a challenge at the end of the service today called bring someone with us. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. All right, so made for mission. Living on mission, all right? This is our mission field. And you're going to see a little graphic up on the screen here in just a second that's going to show you what we believe our mission field is here at Bethel Church. And that is that red dot in the middle. Guess what? That is Bethel Church, all right? And you see that circle around that dot? That is a 10-mile radius around Bethel Church, all right? So when we think about reaching our area it can seem overwhelming, and I don't, I'm not going to take the time to give you population numbers and so forth, but it's a lot of people in that 10-mile radius, okay? It's a lot of people, all right? And so if we think about the church being where we hold services, 
And, you know, that, that can get, get, that's overwhelming, right? This, this little building reaching all, that's, that's overwhelming. But when we begin to realize that the church is the people that attend, then all of a sudden we realize that we have opportunities to make an impact all over the place. So today we're asking the question, why am I on mission? Maybe, maybe while we're here together, you, you are, you're pumped up, right? You're excited. You're, you're pumped up to, to live out the mission that God has put you on this planet to live. But in the craziness of life, sometimes, you know, you're not quite so pumped on Monday morning. You're asking yourself questions like, can I just be a normal dad? Can I just be a normal mom instead of a mom or a dad on a mission? Do I, do I really have to see my school as a mission field? Can I, can I just attend like everyone else? You know, are my jobs hard enough? Do I have to, do I have to try to force spiritual converse, conversations with my unsaved coworkers? You know, maybe, maybe you've asked some of those questions. And before we dive into today's passage, let me just speak to those of you who are brand new to this whole, you know, God, church, Jesus thing. And as you're trying to figure this whole thing out, I think it's important for you to understand that Jesus is inviting us into a chicken pot pie relationship, not a TV dinner one. <laughs> you know, in a TV dinner, you know, it comes in its own compartments, right? It's all separated in different compartments. And so you could, you could devour that steak, but you can completely avoid the broccoli because it's from the devil, right? Or in the, in the, same, in the same way, we can, we can easily break our lives uh, into distinct compartments. You know, you've got one over here titled family and another one titled work and another one are, are friends and, and one for spiritual beliefs and so forth, right? You can, you can divide it all up. And in this image, you could have strong spiritual beliefs that come out on Sundays, but they, they really don't na mix naturally with the other parts of your life. And, and the only problem is that Jesus isn't interested in just your spiritual life. He's interested in your life. Amen? He's interested in your life. And with chicken pot pie... All the food is mixed, right? It's all mixed together. So there's no picking and choosing. The broccoli and the chicken and the carrots, they're all in every bite, whether you like it or not, right? And the same is true with our walk with God. He wants our relationship with him to touch every part of our lives for us to get rid of the compartments, amen? Back in the day, and I don't know how many years ago this was, and, but anyways, back in the day, Carl's Jr., and you might not even know Carl's Jr., but it's, it, it's basically the California version of Hardee's, okay? So if that helps you, right? So the Carl's Jr. had this catchy slogan. It said, if it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in your face. Well, I like that because the same could be said for us in our relationship with God. If it doesn't get all over the place, it doesn't belong in our faith, amen? So our faith, our relationship with the Lord permeates every area of our life. All right, so why am I on mission? <clears throat> I want to share with you from John chapter 13 this morning, and here's what I want to do. I don't want you to turn to the passage and say, what, pastor? No, I, I want you to listen, all right? I don't want you to read it. I don't want you to see it on the screen. I don't want you to look at your device. I want you to hear, all right? The, these things on either side of your head, I want you to use those and listen. If you have to close your eyes to focus, then do that. All right, but I want you to hear what's happening in John chapter 13, all right? These are the first 17 verses, all right? Now, here's what I'm going to do. After we do this, later on, you're going to see the scriptures up on the screen, and you're going to be able to look at them, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig into it, all right? But right now, I just want you to focus in on what was happening in John chapter 13, these first 17 verses, all right? So just listen this morning, all right? It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, 
drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. What a, what a powerful encounter that you had with your disciples. And Lord, I know that you want to say something to us this morning through your word. And I just pray, God, that you would speak clearly to us, that your Holy Spirit would help us now, Lord, that, that you would show us what you want us to, to know and to learn and to put to practice in our lives this morning. I pray for your blessing on this time that we have in your word, and we are thankful for it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. It had been almost three and a half years since the day he dropped everything he'd ever known to step out into a life he knew nothing about. He could still remember Jesus whisper loud enough for only him to hear amidst the crowd, come and follow me. Peter knew very little of what he was getting into, but, but something inside him told him this was the most important decision he would ever make in his life. Now, several years later, he could barely even remember the days when his only goal was catching fish on the Sea of Galilee. He and the other guys, Jesus called his disciples, had watched the blind see, the, the dead rise, the waves become calm, and demons cast out. Even crazier was that at some point, Jesus had actually had them doing the miracles. It never got old seeing the look of joy on a man's face as he, as he walked for the first time after a lifetime of being paralyzed. Here they were in their third Passover meal together. Some, someone, so, somehow, this, this one just felt different. Uh, as the guys found their spots around the table, Jesus didn't go directly to his seat. Instead, he got down on his knees next to a basin of water and began to wash the other guy's feet. The others, like Peter, were speechless. Jesus had spoken about serving others countless times, but this was too much. This, this was going too far. Peter was, was the last one to go, and, and by this point, Peter couldn't stay quiet anymore. No, Lord, he blurted out as he pulled his feet away. And then Jesus looked deeply into Peter's eyes, much like he'd done more than three years ago when they first met and said the words that once again would change his life forever. Once more, Peter slowly extended his feet and watched in disbelief as the creator of the universe washed the gunk between his blistered toes. <laughs> Made for mission. We're on a mission, friends. A mission that Jesus gave us to walk out and to live out in this world. Now, let's, let's, let's focus on those first five verses for just a minute. Let's just focus on those verses for a moment, and, I, and I'll remind you what they say, and it's on the screen for you. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. All right, so he knows this, this time is winding down, right? He's getting ready to soon go to the cross. And so the evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. In other words, that he could do whatever he wanted, right? He had all the power. God had given him all the power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. And even with all that power, right, he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Wow. You know, 
the, the most frequent response people had to Jesus was utter amazement, right? They were amazed. You can see that multiple times in the Gospels, and the people were amazed, or, or they were in awe. They simply did not see it coming. And let me just ask you this morning, is that ever your response to Jesus? Is that ever your response? You know, maybe it was before, but, but now we've been at this Christian thing for a while, right? We kind of know the drill. Some of us have served, served the Lord for, for many, many years, right? Maybe we kind of know the drill. And maybe that's how the disciples felt even after three and a half years of following Jesus. You know, oh, another blind guy can see, you know. Oh, man, huh, there goes. Hey, hey, that guy can walk now, you know. But this, this was something new. This was something different. You're going to wash my feet? Jesus, you're going to wash my feet? No way. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's easy to kind of turn our mission off and turn it back on. But Jesus was always on mission. One obvious difference was that he was and is God. But, but I, think it's, I think it's more than that. He knew why he was on mission, and it was stronger than any of the reasons or excuses that, that could have been given to, to get him off track, right? Think about it. Think about maybe some of the excuses that Jesus could have come up with not to wash their feet, right? He, he could have come up with some excuses like, like we probably would, like he was having a nice meal with his friends, right? This, this is a party, this is a Passover celebration. This is a party. I'm having a nice meal with my friends. I don't, I don't think that about, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to think about serving others or doing something for the next couple of hours. Uh, I, you know, I get it if I'm on a missions trip or, or I'm at church, but can't I just enjoy a Friday night with my friends? Or how about the people at the meal didn't deserve it? Right? They don't deserve it. Jesus knew that Peter would deny knowing him later that night. Judas would betray Jesus in just a few hours and hand him over to be crucified. It's one thing when the people that you're serving are grateful, but that wasn't, that wasn't an excuse for Jesus to bail out here. His servant's heart was bigger than whether the people were deserving. Or Jesus was grossly overqualified. Right? He, was, he was way overqualified. Washing someone's feet was really not even a part or a role of a servant. He, he could have easily built a strong case that this was far beneath him. He could have said, I'll serve, but not that. Or how about seemingly he was making no impact by washing feet? I'm not making any impact. What good does it do? See, uh, another time Jesus spit in the, in the mud. Remember that? He spit in the dirt. He made mud to give sight to a blind guy. This was different. This was not the same thing. E even after Jesus cleaned their feet, an hour later their feet would have been caked in filth again from walking through the dirty streets in open-toed sandals. He could have easily said, what's the point? Or this, was, this, was, this is just really it an undesirable task, right? No, no human should have to clean the nasty gunk between someone else's toes. It, it, it's not as strong of an excuse as the others, but, but I'll bet it was something that he, he probably really, in the flesh, his, his human part, his human side, his flesh, probably didn't really want to do. How many of you would get all excited if I said this morning, you're going to wash somebody's dirty feet? You know, we... we we wouldn't really necessarily be thrilled about it, right? <laughs> and maybe this one, maybe this, this one, he had a lot bigger stuff on his mind. He, he knew that he was about to be arrested and beaten and crucified. We, we read that, that maybe just an, an hour or so later, he's sweating blood because of the stress in his life. It, it, if there was ever a time to think about his own stuff, this would certainly be the one. Yet here he is with every excuse in the book to not, right? Here he is again, amazing those closest to him. How does, how does he do this? This may be one of the most selfless points in his life. How, how do I stay focused and passionate about the mission even when I don't feel like it, when I'm stressed or have some serious anger towards the people that I'm trying to reach out to? How do I do it? Well, 
The foundation of his mission flowed from his identity. It flowed from his identity. You know, I was thinking about this. There's, there's lots of things that, that shape how we see ourselves and how we think other people see us, right? And identity is a huge deal in our culture right now, right? Identity. Well, Dwayne Roberts wrote a book called One Thing, and listen to what he says about our society. He says, we've been bombarded from every angle by the media, and their message is always the same. You don't look good enough, smell good enough, sing well enough, dance well enough. You aren't smart enough, aren't rich enough. And even if you were, you would still be lacking because no one is perfect, least of all you. Think about it for a minute. This is the primary message of most commercials. They have convinced us that it matters if we buy this, shave that, wear this, smoke that, drink this, play that, eat this, and listen to that. Don't you get, ever get tired of being told that you are not worth anyone's time, that you are not valuable, that you are not delighted in? Because that's what it boils down to. We are constantly saturated with the not delightful message. We have all bought into it one way or another. That's why it is so difficult to see. But that doesn't mean it's true. It simply means we need to find the real message, the defining message, the identity-giving message. Thankfully, a commercial can never bestow identity. Our identity is not linked to this world, which means our reward is not in this world either. Our reward is God himself. In this life and the life to come, he wants us. We can have him. Our pursuit should be to gain the reward of having Jesus. This is how it's supposed to be. Amen? What if our identity was truly found in God? In God. Our identity in God. This, this was definitely true for Jesus and the Father. See, he knew who he was. He was the son of God. His mission was clear. He knew whose he was. He was the father's. What, 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 what was there to fear, right? He knew what he was here for. The time had come to pay for the sins of mankind, right? He knew where he was going. He would leave this world and go to the father in heaven. His eyes were looking beyond the cross. He knew where the power came from. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. And as followers of Jesus, these are all true for us as well. When our identity is wrapped up in God, he is infinitely bigger than the circumstances that surround us. Amen? I like what John Stott said. He said, when the Christian loses himself, he finds himself. He discovers his true identity. So Jesus' identity was secure, but that doesn't answer the question of why that led him to wash feet. Seems kind of weird, doesn't it? <laughs> My identity is in Christ, but that has never inspired me to stop and wash my friend's feet, right? I, I'm just telling you, I've never been inspired to wash somebody's feet. Look at verses 6 through 11. I think we can identify with Peter a little bit here. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. All right, so what, what a crazy response. Right? What a crazy response here. If I don't do this, then you have no part with me. If I don't do this, you have no part with me. And you know, one of, one of the simplest descriptions of what our relationship with Jesus is supposed to be like is this. Pour out, pour in, pour out. Pour out, pour in, pour out. And, and we begin by pouring our, ourselves out to God. We, we share with him the good and the bad and the ugly. And like a good parent, Jesus wants to hear us talk about our fears and our stresses and our passions and our dreams. And then we are to pour out to God and then he pours back into us. 
You know, this most often happens through his word, but he can also, can also be through other godly people and circumstances in our life and, and through his Holy Spirit in prayer. He fills us up with encouragement and conviction and guidance and wisdom. And then from this overflow, we then go pour ourselves out to others. And you, you see this in the life of Jesus all, all the time. In, in John 11, Jesus and the disciples get away to pray, to pray, and they pour out, right? They pour out their hearts to God. In John 12, Jesus is anointed by an expensive perfume for really for preparation for burial, and there's a, there's a pouring in there. And then in John 13 here, Jesus washes his disciples' feet. That's a pouring out. And right after this scene, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane where he pours out to his, his whole heart, really, to God, right? Pouring out. And, and the passage says that, that God sends an angel to strengthen him. There's a pouring in. And then finally, Jesus goes from there to give his life on the cross to forgive the sins of all mankind, the ultimate pouring out. Amen? To the, to the depth that I pour out to God is the depth that God pours into me. To the depth that God pours into me is the depth that I'm able to pour out to others. Now, maybe it might be good to get a little bit of a, a visual here of what I'm talking about, right? Here, here's a visual of what I'm talking about. All right, so this here is us, right? This is our life. Um, we've all got junk, right? <laughs> We've all got junk in our life, and we just want to illustrate that with this glass of nasty water that nobody would ever want to drink. Anybody want to try it? Anybody? See, nobody wants to drink this water, right? And it doesn't even smell very good either. So, you know, you, you don't want this, right? This, this is our life. It's all, you know, got its problems. It's got its junk. And what God wants us to do is, is to pour that out to Him. Amen? He wants, to, he wants us to take and pour all that yuck out to him. All right? There we go. Now we've poured all, all that out to God, right? We're, we're, kind of, we're kind of empty now. We're not perfectly clean, but we're, we're a lot better off pouring all that out to God. And then, guess what? God then, he comes with his clean water, his rivers of living water, and he pours into our life, right? Amen? Amen? And so we have, we have his water in us here. We have his crystal clear water, which is just not completely crystal clear because the cup still had some you know, residue in it, right? But you get the idea, right? We're, we got his water in us now, the, the rivers of living water in us. And, and then what does he want us to do? He wants us to then take our water and then pour our water into a hurting and broken world. Amen. Amen. And guess what? We don't have to stay empty, right? Because then he can come along and pour some more water into us. Amen? And we have rivers of living water that continue to flow through our lives. Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Pour out, pour in, pour out. Now, now what would happen if we, if we never took the time to pour out to God through prayer and allowed him to pour into us through his word and through others? All we would have is a dirty cup, right? <laughs> and, and when people came to us in need, uh, uh, this, this dirty water is all that we would have to offer them, right? We don't want that. The reality is that we could, we could very well actually be hurting them more than helping them. If we give them that dirty water over there, they may, maybe they'll get sick. I don't know, right? It, 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 it's not going to do what the healing water of Jesus would do, amen? And for Peter... God is doing this very thing. By washing his feet, he's giving the powerful object lesson of replacing those nasty feet, pouring out with clean ones, pouring in. Amen? Peter's first response was, no way, not going to happen. But Jesus comes back strong and says, if I can't do this for you, Peter, then you've missed the whole point of the past three and a half years. From the very beginning, Jesus' primary call on Peter's life had not been ministry, but was intimacy. Jesus told Peter on day one, follow me. Not do what I do or get in line, right? Jesus invited him first and foremost into a relationship 
follow me, Peter. Amen? Oh, and I will make you a fisher of men. Notice, Peter's job was not to become a fisher of men, but to simply follow Jesus and allow him to make Peter into whatever he wanted. Amen? We get all this stuff in our lives that make us forget what our real identity is. But God wants to cleanse us and remind us who we really are. Amen? Made for mission. Made for mission means life in relationship with God. Amen? Living in relationship with God. And out of that intimacy with Him, out of that relationship with Him, flows the mission of what He wants us to do. Amen? And the two can't ever be separated or, or will fade over time. The exciting thing is that, that out of our identity of being cleansed by God and refilled by His Spirit, He calls us to join Him. Right? We're with Him. Listen to the last thing he tells Peter and the other disciples to do in this passage in verses 12 through 15. Listen to this. All right, he says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to, the, to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? And he asked them, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Okay, so he tells them to go and do the same for others. As I poured into you, now you pour into others. Now, a lot of people want to take this absolutely, completely literal and go wash people's feet. But I don't believe that's what Jesus was saying. Yes, washing people's feet, maybe that's fine, that's good, all right. But I believe he's talking about a lot more than washing feet. He's talking about serving people, pouring our lives out to people, giving to people. Amen? And, and the, the story is true in multiple layers here. Not only do we see where, where Jesus puts his foundation so that he's able to stay on mission even when everyone else would, would give up or walk away, we also find as God pours more of himself into us, he will lead us to a greater level of service and sacrifice. You know, sometimes the gifts of service are considered a little bit second rate to other gifts, like even like the gift of evangelism, right? And without faithful Christians exercising their gift of service, I think the gifts of evangelism are really powerless. Because I think it's so true that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen? Amen. Chuck Colson has made the observation that when the communists took over Russia in 1917, they did not make Christianity illegal. Their constitution, in fact, guaranteed freedom of religion. But they did make it illegal for the church to do any good works. No longer could the church fulfill its historic role in feeding the hungry, educating children, housing orphans, or caring for the sick. What was the result? After 70 years, the church was largely irrelevant to the communities in which it dwelt. See, think about it. Would the community weep if the church were to pull out of the city? Would anybody even notice if we left? Everyone else in our world is all about upward mobility, right? Right? Get a better car, a better house, a better job, a better paycheck. But you know what? God actually leads us to downward mobility. And it's so foreign to our culture, but it's His way. He exchanged a throne in heaven for a cross on earth. And before you write off His words as just kind of cruel or punishing or whatever, listen to what He says next. He says in verses 16 and 17, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. You will be blessed if you do them. Notice he doesn't say serve and sacrifice for others so that God will bless you and give you spiritual brownie points. Instead, he says, you'll be blessed if you do them meaning you're the fortunate one. You're the fortunate one if you do these things. 
I think there's two main reasons he says that we'll be blessed. One, the more we serve and sacrifice out of an overflowing cup, the more we are like Christ. And two, the more we serve and sacrifice, the more we are with Christ. The deeper we go down, the more we get immersed in God's love. It is only here that we truly learn that Jesus is enough. If we have him, we have all that we need. Hallelujah. See, as we live on mission, it's huge that our why is secure. It's simply that our identity is found in Jesus. That we don't have to seek approval in our work, money, accomplishments, our abs, our biceps, our boyfriend, our girlfriend, our husband, our wife, our kids, our parents. We are fully approved by God. You're God's kid. I'm God's kid. From this identity, he now calls us to serve others. We're called to humbly and happily put others' needs before our own. Jesus set the standard pretty high. He is God and he washed the grimy feet of the disciples, and he told us to follow his example. Amen? Amen. Well, let me try to wrap this up. In a book entitled Quiet Talks on Service, Dr. S.D. Gordon, he paints a, a picture, just a, 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 a fantasy, but it's a, a striking uh, picture of, of what God thinks about our mission. All right? Dr. Gordon shows Jesus walking down the golden streets of heaven, He's just returned from earth in his ascension. All heaven is eager to greet him and welcome him. And the first to, to rush up uh, in excitement and, and greet him is, is Gabriel. And, and they've known each other for forever, it seems. <laughs> and these two companions of old walk arm in arm along the streets of gold. And Gabriel, curious, engages Jesus in a conversation that in the fantasy goes something like this. Master, you died for the whole world down there, did you not? Yes. You've suffered much. Yes, the Lord said. And do they all know what you did for them? Said Gabriel. Oh, no, 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 no. Only a, only a few in Palestine know about it so far. And Gabriel replies, well, master, what's your plan? What, what, what have you done about telling the, the world that you died for them, that you shed your blood for all of them? What is your plan? Gabriel waited expectantly, anticipating a grandiose plan along the lines of creation itself. And Jesus answered, Well, I asked Peter and James and John and Andrew and a, a few other fellows to, to make it the business of their lives to tell others. And then the ones they, that, they, that they could tell could tell others, and the ones that they tell could tell others, and the ones that they tell could tell others, and on and on. And finally, it would reach to the farthest corners of the earth, and all would know the thrill and power and the blessing of the gospel. And Gabriel said in reply, but suppose Peter fails. Suppose after a while that John just doesn't tell anybody. What if James and Andrew are ashamed or afraid? What if the rest of them simply chicken out? What then? To which Jesus replied, Gabriel, I haven't made any other plans. I'm counting totally on them. We, friends, are God's plan to reach the world. We are God's plan to reach the world. Amen? And, and this next week, let's just pour out all of our stuff to Jesus and allow him to pour himself back into us. Amen? Romans 10, 15 says, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And as we spend time with God each day, and God washes us each day, He will then send us out with some beautiful feet. Do you have beautiful feet today? <laughs> Do people say, oh, you've got beautiful feet? They only come from being with Jesus. Amen? Amen? And let me, let me warn you, you might not get it right. <laughs> Peter and his clean feet fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane an hour later when he's supposed to be praying. A few hours later, he denies even knowing Jesus and runs off in guilt. So what does Jesus do? A few days later, Jesus meets him on a beach where it all began. And what do they do? Peter pours out. Jesus pours into Peter, 
And then Peter pours out to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and the rest is history. Amen? Listen, friend, don't give up on a God who has never given up on you. Satan might whisper in your ear, you can't do it. Don't stretch yourself. You'll fail. But God pours in his whisper and says, I still believe in you. I'm not done with you. The best is yet to come. You have no idea. Just trust me one more day. Get back up. I'll be strong in your weakness. I've got this. You're not alone. Hallelujah. Did you know that the book of Mark comes from the testimony of Peter? You know what is so cool? A few decades later, when it's written, Peter's identity is so sure that he includes all of his mistakes. <laughs> right? They're all there, right? Can you, can you just picture Peter? Oh, you know, that's when I screwed up and I cut the dude's ear off. You know, that's, that's when, I, when I fell asleep. That's when I, I took my eyes off Jesus and I started sinking, right? <laughs> See, the foundation of his mission flowed from his identity in Christ, and the same is true for us as well. Who knows? Our worst moments might serve to help others when they feel like they're failing. Amen? I love what D.L. Moody said. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And that which I can do, by the grace of God, I will do. Amen? We were made for mission. Let's live on mission. Amen? You know, I'd like us to just pause here and remember what the Lord Jesus has done for us. We we would not have the, the good news to share if Jesus had not come to this earth and given his life for us. Amen? If Jesus hadn't come to this world and given his life for us, We would not have good news to share. There would be no point in us being here today, amen? And so what I want us to do on this Palm Sunday, this week before Easter, is to take the elements of communion together this morning, amen? And just remember what Jesus has done for us. I think it's a a great way to close this, uh, this message out is just to remember that Jesus gave his life for us, that, that we have a purpose Amen? That he called us, that he saves us, that he fills us, and that we can go and live for him and live that mission. So on your seat somewhere around you are the elements of communion, and you go ahead and, and you can go ahead and open the little clear part on top. It just peels right back. And get out the bread, and just hold that until you're instructed to take it together with everyone. We do believe in an open communion, so if you know the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior, you're welcome to participate with us this morning. Just please take the elements when you're instructed. We read in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven 27 through 30, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number have fallen asleep. And so it's very important this morning before we take the bread, before we take the juice, that we recognize where we're at with the Lord. And that we make sure that our heart is right, that we have poured our heart out to Jesus. That we've taken that old dirty water and we've poured it out to Jesus. We've given it over to Him. And if you haven't done that yet, then do that this morning. Or maybe, maybe in the past few weeks, uh, some, some of that dirty water's gotten back in there. <laughs> and you need to say, Lord, forgive me. Wash me cleanse me this morning. So would you just take a moment and examine your heart this morning? Let's all do that right now. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, I just ask that you would wash us this morning. Cleanse us, Lord. God, I just pray that you would help us all just to pour out our hearts to you. 
Lord, to look to you for forgiveness and for cleansing this morning. Lord Jesus, that you would wash us and cleanse us and forgive our sin, Lord. Make us afresh and anew today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your cleansing power. Thank you for washing us, for cleansing us, and using us for your glory, Lord. God, as we prepare to take these elements, Lord, I just pray that we would all be clean before you today. And we'll give you praise and we'll give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think about the body of the Lord, we we have the bread that reminds us. It's a a symbol of his body, of what he went through for us, what he did for us, and, and going to the cross. And when we look in in the Gospels and we read in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, it says that while they were eating that Jesus took the bread and he he broke the bread and he gave thanks and he he gave it to them and he said, take it and eat, This this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do that this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your body. We thank you for... Uh, what you went through for us, the fact that you went to the cross, that you gave yourself willingly for us, Lord. And God, we're reminding, reminded of that this morning, and we honor that, Lord. And we're grateful and we're thankful, Lord. And God, we just ask that as we, as we eat this bread together this morning, that you would bless it. Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may eat the bread. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Then we have the juice that reminds us of the blood of Jesus. And we know that the word of God says that there's no cleansing, there's no remission, there's no no covering for sin without the blood. And Jesus shed his blood for us that washes and cleanses us. And again, in the Gospels, in Matthew, and Mark, and in Luke, we, we read that he took the cup, and he gave thanks. He offered it to them, and, and they drank from it. He said, this is, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. And then in Luke, he says that it, this is the covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Hallelujah. We give thanks. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you came and you... You gave yourself for us that you shed your blood. God, that we don't have to have some animal sacrifice that covers our sin, Lord, that you once and for all went to the cross and you gave yourself and your blood was shed for us that cleanses us and washes us, that cleans us this morning. And God, we are grateful for that. We are thankful, Lord Jesus. We honor that. We give you praise and we give you thanks. Lord, we remember what you did for us on the cross in shedding your blood. And we ask now as we drink this cup together, Lord, that you would bless it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may drink the cup. Praise God. Can we just give him praise for a minute, church? Give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. Now, very quickly, I'm going to wrap up the series. And so we have, I have another sermon for you. Are you ready? All right. You're saying, how long is that? Well, I have two and a half pages. All right. So, and I'm pretty quick. So I'm going to go fast. This is bring someone with you. This is the final part of this series. This is wrapping it up. All right. So God's calling on our life is bigger than our lifetime. Now, that's not true automatically, but if we join God in his mission, it will be. So how do I do that? That's 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 kind of been the whole point of this series. But I want to I want to end with one more huge truth. And that is this. Bring someone with you as you go live the mission that you were made for. Don't go alone. Don't do it alone. Bring someone along for the ride. This may be the single greatest leadership lesson that we learn from the life of Jesus. You could could make a strong case that Jesus is the greatest leader of all time. And he never wrote any books. He never held a public office. He never went outside of one small area of the world. He was only on the public scene for a little more than, than three years. And then he died at the age of 33. 
And yet here we are more than 2,000 years later, and there's almost 3 billion people following him from all corners of the earth in hundreds of different languages. And the movement he started is growing faster now worldwide than ever before. That's pretty good leadership. Amen? That's pretty good leadership. So bring someone with you. You know how many times that the Bible says that Jesus took his disciples and they went somewhere? Anybody? No, me neither. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't either. Because I, I started to count through the Gospels and I lost track because there's just about, just about every time he went somewhere, he intentionally brought people with him. You know, yes, there are, there are a few examples of when he got alone, but the evidence is abundantly clear that, that with incredible intentionality, Jesus brought people with him. He brought them with him on the mission. Listen to, listen to some of the last words of Jesus here. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You probably know this verse. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Hallelujah. You know, in the, in the Greek, the literal translation is, as you go, make disciples. As you go, make disciples. Think about, think about the different applications to this command. One is definitely that as you go through your life, intentionally share Jesus with the people you meet and then disciple them in their faith. Amen? And the other application, and, and I don't think I've ever heard it, someone say it, but it's obvious from watching Jesus' life, don't just disciple the people that you meet along the way, but also bring people along with you and disciple them while you go through your day-to-day -day life and responsibilities. Amen? Jesus ends with promising that he will be with us always to the very end of the age. If he's truly in the driver's seat of our life, then it's not so much that we're bringing him with us, but instead, he's bringing us with him. Amen? So, so what he did for the disciples 2,000 years ago, Jesus still wants to do in our lives today. As he disciples us now, he invites us to do the same with others. Listen, friend, God's calling on your life is bigger than your lifetime. All right? And there's only one last, there's only one thing that will last. Right? There's only one thing. See, the, the stuff that you are stressing about now won't. It, it, it probably will be no big deal even in a couple of years. I had a pastor that I served with who used to say, what's it going to matter in 100 years? <laughs> right? And, and your, your own great-grandkids that wouldn't even exist if it were not for you won't even know your name. But, if you bring someone with you, that will be celebrated for all eternity. What is God calling you to do? Who, who can you bring with you on mission? Who in your life does not know God? Who will you invite to pursue God with you? I want to just introduce you to a phrase that is the perfect response to what we've been talking about for the past six weeks. Will you put your yes on the table? Will you put your yes on the table? When it comes to God, will your answer be yes before you even know what the question is? God, I don't know where or how or when or who, but my yes is on the table. Amen? My yes is on the table. And that's how we're going to end this series this morning. All right? Would you stand to your feet and on the seat around you somewhere, there's a yes card, all right? And the worship team is going to lead us in a song in just a minute, and I want, you to, I want you to pull out that card that we placed on your seat this morning, and if this is the desire of your heart this morning, would you just fill it out, put your name on it, and who you're going to bring with you, all right? That's basically all there is to it, who, who you are and who you're going to bring with you, and while the, while the worship team plays this song, sings this song, they lead us in a song, I want you to come and place it on the table. That's why the table is up here. That's why the, the communion table is up here this morning. Because I want to see it full of yeses. 
See, pastors, some of us, we, in our mind's eye, we, we see what we want to happen at the end of the service. <laughs> and here's what I kept seeing in my mind, a bunch of yeses on this table right here. Amen? So if that's you this morning and you say, yes, I, 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 I can say yes to God. I don't need all the details. I don't need all the particulars. I'm just going to say yes to God then you can fill that out and you can come and put it on the table. And if you'll, if you'll put it just like this, I'm going to put mine there first so you know which way to put it. All right? But I'm going to pray and the worship team is going to sing. And as they sing, whenever you feel ready, whenever you're ready, come and put your yes on the table. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for, for these past six weeks, Lord, and what you've shown us and what you've told us and what you've done in us, Lord, and the challenges that we are that you're bringing to us, Lord, I pray, God, that we would all be able to respond, that we'd all positively respond to who you are and what you're saying in our lives, and that each and every one of us would be able to say, yes, Lord, whatever, whoever, however you want to use me, the mission that you have, I'm going to say, yes, Lord. I'm going to put my yes on the table today, Lord. Help us to do that this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Come, put your yes on the table this morning, amen. Resting in your promise, I will rest within the knowledge that you care. I put my trust in you. Deep within the darkness, though my enemies surround, I will not fear. I put my trust in you. When I don't know what to do, Jesus, I will fix my eyes on you. You're my defender. I had my hope in you. You are the loving arms no broken heart can run to. I will remember. That there is nothing you can do Cause you are God, you are good And I surrender You're my defender You're my defender You are strong when I am weakest. You're the peace that passes everything I see. I put my trust in you. I'm surrendering completely, laying all my cares here at your feet. I put my trust in you. When I don't know what to do, Jesus, I will fix my eyes on you. You're my defender. I had my hope in you. You are the loving arms my broken heart can run to. I will remember that there is nothing you can do cause you are god you are good and i surrender oh a mighty fortress is our god i will not fear i will not Safe and secure here in your will, I will not fear. And when I don't know what to do, Jesus, I will fix my eyes on you. You're my defender. I had my hope in you. 
You are the thing arms my broken heart can run to. I will remember that there is nothing you can't do. Cause you are God, you are good, and I surrender. You're my defender. Amen. Um, we're going to wrap up. If you guys would stand with me, I'm going to pray a blessing. Lord, thank you so much for the challenge this morning uh, that you've placed before us. Thank you for the opportunity to be your plan. Not just a part where there's a backup if we fail, but we are your plan for this world. And God, we are grateful for it. God, I pray this week as we go that you would give us strength to be bold uh, where we need to be bold. You would give us wisdom to speak in the times that you want us to speak and to be silent and listen to care for those around us. God, I pray that you would help us to see ways that we can bring others along with us on this journey. God, I pray that you would help us to be purposeful in the way that we pour ourselves out onto you and to be filled again with your living water so that we can pour out into those around us. God, I pray that we would take to heart all of the things that you've challenged us today, that we would meditate on them each day, and that we would act on them as we walk throughout our days. God, remind us that you are with us always, and bless us as we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a great week.